Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Thank you for tuning in today for our uh, free webinar on wellbeing, resilience, and, and putting your oxygen mask on first. Um, my name is Julian Hackenberg. Uh, I am the HR manager for my HR in Australia. Um, I've nearly a decade's worth of experience providing HR and employment relations advice and support to to businesses of all different shapes and sizes and industries. Um, today's session is actually our first ever Trans-Tasman webinar. So um, we're glad to be running it and, and thank you all for, for tuning in. Um, today's session will be looking at the, the damaging effects of, of chronic stress and, and coping uh, strategies around um, you know, stress and anxiety and that sort of thing uh, for, for employers and, and, and business leaders looking at the, the key differences between toxic and um, tough in working environments and, and covering some key steps to support your own well-being before looking at the sort of flow on effects of, of well-being and stress um, on, on our employees as well. So today I'm joined by my colleague Sylvie thrush -Mars. Uh, Sylvie is the head of Platinum Services for My HR in New Zealand. She's an award-winning senior HR and employment relations consultant. And after many years hosting My HR webinars, she'll be a familiar face to, to many in the New Zealand audience. Um, so yeah, we'll hand it over to Sylvie in, in just a moment. Before we do so though, just a, a few housekeeping points. Um, today's session is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be available afterwards on the My HR website. Uh, any questions uh, will be recorded and, and available afterwards. So only use details that you're comfortable with sharing um, when submitting a question uh, anonymously. Um, and if there are questions, we'll, we'll cover those at the end in a, a Q&A session. Um, so you can either submit those through um, or pop them in through at the end of the, the chat. But if you, you can provide them through throughout the session or, or provide them through at the end. So, um, okay, so Sylvie, over to you, if you could sort of take us through the, the, the main topics of today's session. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you, Julian. Love the intro. Um, and thanks everyone for joining our uh, first ever Trans-Tasman webinar. Like so many things at MyHR, it's the first time we're giving this a go. So if you've got feedback about um, how it tracks and how Julian and I share some of the speaking responsibilities, um, as always, that is, that is super welcome. So I'll jump in and start sharing my screen with the content we're going to be going through today. So bear with me as I get this sorted. So what should be coming through is just our title slide with the uh, MyHR topic for today. Um, just some context around what we're going to be discussing. Julian and I will be covering off, um, as he's pointed out, some, some issues around stress and the damaging effects that can happen on our personal and mental, uh, physical and mental well-being. We'll be looking at some of the ways that we can... Um, uh, adapt to this as individuals and we will be talking about ways to bring better well-being and resilience into workplaces. Um, hopefully you know as, as you know both of us that neither of us are mental health or um, medical experts so if you have questions about specific mental conditions about your own health and well-being um, about anything to do that kind of verges into the, the medical territories we will respectfully direct you into other places to ask those questions um, if you have questions though in a workplace context um, around some of the ways that you can build your own resilience and address your own well-being in a safe and sustainable way this is totally the place to do it um, so just a real quick word on what we will and won't be covering off today um, um, as it relates to our expertise and what we can bring value by talking about. So today's topics, the first thing we'll talk about is actually what well-being is and what it isn't, because it can be easy to get well-being and kind of surviving confused. Um, we'll talk about the risks to our well-being in the workplaces that we work in. We'll talk specifically about stress and the damaging effects that has on our physical and uh, mental well-being and why. We'll then turn to the positive stuff, so building well-being, what it is that we can be doing as individuals and as people who have ownership in the spaces that we work in to create safer spaces. We'll talk about sustainable ways of managing change for yourself and for others. Building healthier workplaces is when I'll hand back to Julian to speak particularly to um, some of the work that he's been doing with our clients. And then, of course, we'll have time for questions, as always. Um, I'm expecting this to take about 30 to 35 minutes for content and then um, sort of 20 minutes for questions. So I'll be keeping um, myself to time. And Julian, of course, if I'm uh, running over, you can just give me a buzz and I'll, I'll keep things moving. Beautiful. 
So when we're talking about well-being, what we're talking about is, is not just doing okay and not being in crisis. Not being in crisis is important, but we're actually talking about a more holistic understanding of what well-being is for all of us. So really briefly, it's the ability to cope with the day-to-day -day stresses of life, to work productively, interact positively with others in ways that aren't causing harm, and to realise our own potential. So it's clearly more than the absence of mental illness, and it's more than just feeling happy. We know that well-being is supported by good physical health and good mental health. So not only are we talking about how we're feeling and how we're coping on the inside, um, we all inhabit bodies, most of us, I'm pretty sure. If you don't, please, please call an ambulance. Um, so having a really good body to inhabit and live in not only is good for our physical health, but there are places where they cross over and where your mental well-being and physical well-being affect each other and vice versa. So we'll talk about some of the risks to well-being and we've, for ease of conversation, grouped them into mental and physical, although there are lots of other dimensions we could be using. So we know that um, harassment and discrimination can have really significant effects on your mental well-being. Um, we know that bullying and isolation likewise can have really chronic impacts on your health. Um, there was some research out of both the UK and Australia that talked about how social isolation significantly increases your risk of premature death from all causes. So not just from um, heart attacks or from heart disease, but from all other causes of death that were studied, which is a risk that may rival those of smoking, obesity and physical inactivity. Um, there is a lot of stigma around isolation and loneliness. It can feel a bit kind of cringe to say I'm feeling a bit lonely. And, and would like to reach out. Um, but when you look at the risks of long-term loneliness on your health and well-being, it's really important that you do reach out and have those conversations. Um, if you have a mental illness or, or a psychiatric condition, of course, that can affect your mental well-being. If you're going through a difficult relationship, whether it's um, a boss or a colleague who you're having trouble with, whether it's a parent where the relationship's not the way you would like it to be, or you know, a, a partnership or a relationship that's breaking down, um, all of that has impacts on your mental well-being and um, can cause yeah, kind of long-term chronic effects. In terms of your physical well-being, accidents are, are sort of the thing that we think about as a risk to health because it's um, usually quite dramatic and quite acute and there's, there's clearly something that's happened. Um, but injury and illness likewise are, are ways that our physical well-being can, can be worn down over time. Um, genetics are certainly a part of what can cause physical poor health as well as mental health, so really that should be on both sides. Um, and a sedentary lifestyle is, is one of the areas of poor physical health that's getting the most attention kind of in the literature over the last two to three years. So as an example, some research out of the US um, found that men who watch more than 23 hours of television a week have a 64% higher chance of dying from cardiovascular disease than men who only watch 11 hours of TV a week. Now that's controlling for all other factors. So it wasn't that the men who are watching 23 hours a week were also adrenaline junkies who were skydiving and having kind of extreme sporting accidents. We are, we are now really clinky, clearly linking physical inactivity and a sedentary lifestyle to some quite serious health outcomes. Um, we also know that inactivity or having a, a quite... Um, with a lifestyle without much physical activity causes between 20 and 25 percent of breast cancers and colon cancers, about 27 percent of diabetes cases, and about 30 percent of heart disease. So having a sedentary lifestyle where you're not getting enough physical activity um, can have really detrimental impacts on your health. Areas which um, can bring risks to both your mental and physical well-being. If we're talking about trauma, that's obviously a pretty key one. So you might have had um, experienced abuse in your life. You might have had um, a really, really stressful situation. There might have been a, an accident or an incident which has left you with trauma. Um, this can have some really serious impacts on your physical and mental well-being, as we know. Um, the pandemic has been friggin' exhausting. I don't know about you, but I'm knackered and really looking forward to the holiday break. So the pandemic has meant that we can't exercise as much as we might normally. We can't go to gyms. Um, it's increased kind of reports of isolation and loneliness. It's just been a bit of a shit time for everyone. So obviously we're never getting through all that. Um, unreasonable workloads at work certainly can cause stress if you're having to spend long hours seated at your desk or, or working long hours out on site. That will affect some of these other factors. 
Um, sleep deprivation is something that we don't talk about as much as we could, but that certainly has some really clearly documented um, uh, impacts on physical and mental well-being. And then substance abuse, which often starts out as a coping mechanism, um, long-term has pretty serious impacts on your health as well. And the reason stress is bolded is that stress is the, the link between bad things happening and poor mental and physical outcomes. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about stress in particular because all of these bad things that happen generate stress for us and stress is where our body is trying to solve a problem but doesn't always do it in a super helpful way. So stress is the way that our body responds to, to pressure or to difficult or to challenges. Um, lots of just different situations and life events can cause stress. Um, some of us find Christmas a favourite time of year. Some of us dread it. And when we start seeing, you know, um, wreaths being put up in supermarkets, our, our stomach starts sinking. Um, but what's really important is that we all deal with stress differently. So some of us will um, retreat and need a bit more time to ourselves to cope with a challenging situation. Some of us will reach out and, and seek help. Um, we all have different stress thresholds. If you've ever dealt with someone who seemed completely unflappable and someone who got very stressed quite easily, we'll know that we've got different stress thresholds. Um, and what's important and, and what the key link is here is that when we are encountering stress, whether that's from something we're, we're personally worried about or an external event that's happening to or around us, our body produces stress hormones that trigger a flight or fight response and activate our immune system to prep us for the dangerous bad thing that's happening. So sometimes the stress response can be really useful. Um, it'll push us through um, fear or worry to, to get something done, whether that's running a marathon delivering a speech, um, hypothetically presenting a webinar, you know, all of these things are, are situations where a bit of stress in the short term can be quite helpful and can, can focus us and get us through the challenge. What we're talking about when we talk about kind of the, the health impacts of stress, though, is that when you are experiencing too much stress, it, your, your body doesn't know how to cope with chronic prolonged periods of stress. Um, it can leave us in a permanent state of fight or flight, which means that we end up feeling overwhelmed or unable to cope. And we'll talk a little bit about the impacts of stress on our um, biochemistry in a second. Long term, what this means is it can affect our physical and mental health. So the takeaway really is that stress is really normal and natural. Everyone goes through different periods of stress. Um, we all have different thresholds for what we find stressful, and we've got different ways of, of dealing with and coping with that. Um, stress in the short term can be really helpful. It gets us to pay attention to the thing that's critical at that point in time. It can get us to perform under challenging circumstances. But long term, it's not a healthy place to be in, and we're going to be talking about some of the ways that we can manage those, those long-term impacts of stress today. So in terms of the impact of stress on your physical health, um, when you're stressed and your body is producing a lot of adrenaline, that can lead to ulcers because your body isn't used to or designed to having adrenaline floating around for long periods of time. Um, your elevated heart rate, which preps you to fight the saber-toothed tiger or run away from the baddies, um, elevates your heart rate and that then puts more pressure on your circulatory system, which is having to work harder to keep blood flowing around your body. Um, that elevated blood pressure long term can lead to heart disease. When you're stressed, your body's releasing corticosteroids to get pumped up to deal with whatever the, the threat is. Over time, those weaken your immune system. It's one of the reasons that when you um, are stressed, you get colds more often. Um, and that can also contribute to higher blood cholesterol, which then leads to heart disease. So these are just a couple of, honestly, the kind of 30 different examples I found when we were researching this topic. But what I really want to draw your attention to is that stress isn't just about feeling a bit under pressure and it's not just about taking a concrete pill and sucking it up. There are really chronic long-term impacts that stress can have on your health physically, um, which then can kind of compound over time. So that's the takeaway here. And mental health, of course, is the flip side of that coin. So almost one in two New Zealanders will meet the criteria for a mental illness at some point in their lifetime. Um, half is pretty staggering. I didn't realise it was so high, so I started doing some work in this area. Um, and it means that it's not really a question of if, it's actually a question of when you or a loved one is going to have some, some mental challenges that you need some support with. 
We know um, from research that the Mental Health Foundation has supported that one in four Kiwis have a serious mental health episode every single year. So statistically, every year, a quarter of the population have had a serious mental health episode. Um, that's not just having a bit of a cry because you've had a shit day. That's not just needing to go in and do a gym class to work off some steam. Um, these are episodes where you are prevented from functioning and, and are in a mental health crisis. So one in four is pretty staggering. Some of the common mental health conditions that we um, in New Zealand have higher rates of, um, depression of course is one that gets a lot of airtime, um, anxiety disorders are on the rise as well, those might be um, generalised anxiety or more specific forms of anxiety like phobias, um, obsessive compulsive disorder is one that I know I've been guilty of joking about in the past, but really in, in really debilitating cases, it can be incredibly intrusive thoughts that you can't control because your brain is obsessively and compulsively presenting you with, with content that isn't really helpful. Um, PTSD is one that we talk about and often follows on from um, a chronic, uh, a, a chronically difficult situation or an accident or a one-off kind of incident. Um, and bipolar disorder where you swing from manic episodes through to depression is, is something we deal with as well. So if you or anyone that you love or care about or in your life is dealing with any of these conditions, um, there is a lot of help out there and there's a lot of resources that can support you either as you navigate your mental well-being or as a loved one does. Um, the Mental Health Foundation in New Zealand is, is the best place to go for those resources. Something, of course, through Australia because we have a, a trans Tasman audience today, which is very exciting. So we know that one in seven Australians will experience depression in their lifetime. Um, and a message here again is depression is not feeling blue for a day because your favourite Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavour has sold out. It's a debilitating or chronic situation where you feel incredibly hopeless and it's really hard for you to, to navigate through your day-to-day -day life. We know that one in four Australians will experience an anxiety condition in their lifetime. Um, and we know that there is much more um, demand for support and support services out there where there are half of all people with a condition now getting treatment. Um, I find that enormously encouraging that people aren't languishing in silence, um, but half is still not everyone. So one in two Australians who have mental health challenges and not getting support for their conditions. Um, if you do have any interest in looking into this further in Australia, um, the Beyond Blue organisation is a great place to start. Um, and I'm sure... Uh, Julian would be able to point you in the direction of some of those resources as well. Oh, and the last piece here, sorry, that must have been our animations not being in the right order. Um, one in five Australians experience a common mental health disorder during any 12-month period. Um, that's slightly down on New Zealand's one in four, so maybe the brain drain does have something behind it, us searching for, for greener pastures. Um, but there are comparable numbers in that between a quarter and a fifth of the population will have a, a mental health challenge um, during any given year. So we now turn to some of the cool stuff around what we can do to build resilience for ourselves and put our own oxygen masks on before we face up to our busy and demanding lives and businesses and families. Um, but a, a word on resilience, because it gets bandied around a lot, um, there is a difference between dealing with a tough situation and building up your resilience to that and dealing with a toxic situation that is, is not healthy and not good for you. So what is tough makes you stronger. Um, working through a fear of public speaking could be an example. It's a common one. Um, dealing with a tough assignment at work, um, stepping up into a community leadership role in your, in your extracurricular, your faith communities. Um, those can all be tough. And so you want to build your resilience and be ready for them. Um, toxic situations are not like that. You cannot self-care your way out of bullying, harassment, poverty, an unsustainable workload, or any of the other conditions where it's just bad for any person and anyone would find those situations challenging. So if you are dealing with a toxic situation versus a tough one, um, I strongly suggest that you do get professional help and get some support to navigate your way through that. Um, but if you are dealing with some tough situations and want to look at building your resilience so you can show up to get the shit done that you want to get done, um, these are some of the things that we, um, that research supports and says are, are helpful to look at. So... In the moment, if you are having a, a swell of something being a bit tough, it's really important to do some recognition work around what it is that's causing you distress. 
So setting and recognizing your boundaries versus your limits is a really, really important thing to be aware of as a parent, a colleague, um, a sibling, um, a friend sometimes. So your, your boundary is the point up until you can kind of make sensible decisions. So I know that if I'm um, dealing with a challenging client, for example, I love everyone on this webinar, of course, but we do sometimes have challenging clients that come through. Um, what's important is that I know I have a boundary beyond which I will start making poor choices. So set your boundary before your limit, because after you get to your limit, you are making shit choices and kind of out in a position to show up in a way that's important. So recognize what your limit is and set a boundary before that whether that's dealing with um, your children or issues at home or, or whatever you might be navigating. Identify whether the challenge or the issue is acute or chronic. Um, is it just a one-off kind of hassle that you don't have to deal with again, like having to you know, post a parcel and be worried about it getting there in time for Christmas? Or is it a chronic situation that consistently causes you distress, like the way one of your colleagues speaks to you and it kind of hasn't resolved? So if it's an acute problem that you can kind of just navigate through and brush off, that's fine. If it's a chronic issue, it warrants a bit more of your attention and time to figure out a way to navigate through it. Um, ask a loved one if you aren't someone who's had much experience thinking about your own behaviours and stress responses to challenging situations. Um, if you've got a boss who you trust, um, you might find it helpful to ask them, how do you know when I'm under pressure? Like, what does it look like? So if you need some help with actually recognising when you're having a tough time, um, your loved ones will probably have a bit of a sense and they might be a good first port of call to start doing some reflective work and recognising when you're feeling under pressure. And of course, identify your stress behaviours. Um, I know that if I find myself um, not getting as much exercise as I normally do and feeling a bit more kind of chained to my desk or my projects or my housework than I, than I normally am, um, I know that one of my stress behaviours is trying to really focus in on solving the problem, which can make me a bit you know, narrow-sighted and, and I need to remember to get that perspective. So I catch myself working too hard on whatever it might be. I know that's an indicator that I'm feeling stressed and I might need to put some attention towards driving that stress for me. So once you've done some recognition around what causes you stress and, and how, how you might deal with that in the moment, um, you then need to respond to the situation and you need to do this in a place and a time when you are calm, um, you've had some good sleep, you're hydrated, you're well resourced and you can kind of engage with the problem in a more deliberate and intentional way. So the first thing to do is triage the situation and understand what's happening um, and then asking the questions around what needs to change, what support do you need from yourself, your family, your friends, your colleagues. Um, if, it's, if it's all a bit much right now, can you pause the situation? Can you take some time out from being the captain of your local sports team because it's just freaking you out right now with all of the other, you know, other work you've got going on? Um, can you take a week off work to just get your head clear and take a bit of a breather? Um, but if you can't change the situation, if you can't um, get the support that you need to see you through it, and it's impossible to kind of pause and take a breather to, to recharge. Um, asking the question about whether you can exit the situation is an important one. Um, there are some uh, contexts and situations and jobs and relationships and friendships that are not healthy for us. So if there's no possible way to respond to make it a situation that is sustainable, um, asking if you can exit it is one, is one that's quite important. So talking specifically about building physical resilience then, um, a healthy body supports a healthy mind, um, and I certainly want to be able to walk up and down stairs when I'm 50 without problems, um, there's, there's a couple of few things that we need to be mindful of, and this is probably nothing new, but hopefully you take it away and, and get reminded about some of the things we can do to be supporting um, our physical well-being. So first, of course, is exercise. Um, cardio exercise will strengthen um, your, your lungs and your respiratory system and your circulatory system. Strength exercises like lifting weights or resistance training will do things like strengthen your bones to prevent against falls. So if you're someone who only does strength training or only does cardio, um, have a think about mixing it up and, and getting a bit of variety in there. If you're someone who does no exercise, pick one thing and just start doing it on a, on a weekly or a daily basis just to keep yourself moving. Staying hydrated is also really important. So we know that if you are 
not hydrated and in a good space, the symptoms are very similar to fatigue. You start getting a bit foggy brained. Um, it's a bit harder to think. You, you physically slow down. Um, it's harder to keep your temporary manager emotions. So if you're someone who struggles to get through enough water in a day or if you find yourself being tired constantly, try just adding one glass of water to your daily menu or your daily operations and see if that makes a difference. Um, healthy eating is something I uh, need to keep on top of myself, um, but making sure that you have a good variety of foods and a good mixture of things. Um, this isn't the space to talk about nutrition at length, but making sure that you are getting enough fruits and vegetables, a good mix of what your body needs to, to perform, um, and certainly talk to a nutritionist if, you, if you're not sure. Um, I've worked with a nutritionist before. It was way less scary and judgmental than I was expecting. Um, so if you're genuinely not sure what you need in your diet to perform at your best, um, do go and talk to someone because they, they have all the tools. So it's about um, kind of doing your own learning and building a sustainable eating habits for yourself. And then good sleep is really important here. So we know that if you um, don't get enough sleep a night for you, um, you're more likely to be an abusive boss. You're more likely to develop Alzheimer's later on. You're more likely to overeat and weight gain. You're much more likely to have mental health challenges. There's almost not a single area of physical and mental well-being that sleep doesn't improve or prevent against deterioration in. So if you aren't someone who gets good sleep, um, there's a really excellent book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, which goes into this in a lot more detail. Um, but do pay attention to your sleeping habits and see if there is if there is um, improvements you can make there to make sure you are getting good quality sleep. And the last comment here before we move on to building resilience, um, make sure that you have safe working practices. Um, do take regular breaks. They are written into the law for a reason. It is really important for your own health and safety that you are taking regular breaks. Set an alarm on your clock if you need to. Whatever you need to do to make sure that you are taking, taking those breaks away from work. Um, make sure you've got the right equipment for the job. If you're doing heavy lifting and you're um, slight like me, do you need a harness to help with carrying things? Um, if you're built a bit more solidly than I am, do you need to be um, careful around your flexibility and making sure that you're, you're lifting in a safe way? Um, whatever your working practices are, make sure that there isn't um, risk that is unnecessary or that can be guarded against and, and your manager or your health and safety group will be able to help with that as well. Now, mental resilience is one that's a bit harder to understand because it's not visible and it's really different for everyone. Um, but mental resilience basically involves four actions and behaviours that anyone can learn and develop. Um, resilience is an ordinary characteristic because anyone can develop it. It's not an extraordinary skill or secret ingredient that only a few of us have. It's something that everyone can learn and get better at. So the five ways that are most supported by research in terms of building your own mental resilience are changing the narrative around what it is that you're thinking and telling yourself, so your own internal dialogue, um, facing your fears through something like exposure therapy or just seeking out things that are a bit uncomfortable for you, builds the muscle needed to deal with other uncomfortable things in the future. Seeking help, unsurprisingly, is on the list of things that builds mental resilience. So if you need to go and talk to a counsellor, if you've got a trusted friend or mate you can go and have a conversation with, um, a burden shared is a burden halved. So making sure that you are taking advantage of the things that can be supportive in that social support space um, is really important and can be a key tool for building that resilience. Just talking about it is also really important, again, with a counsellor or a friend um, and taking a break, whether that's a uh, holiday overseas, whether it's a, a long weekend to recharge, whether it's an hour to go for a walk around the block, leaving the tough thing alone and going away and coming back has shown to be more helpful for resolving the issue long term than just slugging away at it and, and, and keeping knocking it out. So taking a break, um, whether it's short or long, can be really important. And the last piece for me before I hand over to Julian to talk about some of the ways we can build healthier workspaces. Um, one of the things that I found really challenging over um, the work that I've done with the clients for the last few years is finding ways to build really sustainable change rather than talking a big game in a webinar or a seminar and then vanishing and having to go back to your normal life to kind of 
implement all of this cool stuff we talk about. So an approach that over the last probably two and a half years I found really helpful is thinking about just doing one thing differently every month. Um, and it builds on work by James Clear, who has um, written and studied habits for most of his professional life. I really recommend his book, Atomic Habits. Um, it's one both Julian and I coincidentally have read and taken away a lot from. So if you're interested in building sustainable change, um, it, that's an awesome resource. But the 60-second TED Talk, if you don't have space to read a book, um, is that building habits is the key to effective and sustainable change. Um, habits are things that our bodies or our brains do automatically. So we don't have to think every time we brush our teeth how we're going to brush our teeth. We just kind of do it because we remember the motions. Um, the same principle holds when you're trying to build healthier practices and habits for yourself at work and also for your for your team and your colleagues. So if you're trying to improve your physical resilience, um, some examples of small sustainable changes might be something like limiting yourself to two beers every drinking session. You don't have to go the whole hog and go cold turkey. Just cut down on the beers. And over a year, that might be some really quick math, a thousand beers that you haven't drunk, which is a huge change and a huge impact on your well-being. Um, commit to a thousand more steps per day than you normally do. Um, we know that about seven and a half thousand steps is the max every day. I have never been anywhere near to hitting that. But if you can do a thousand more steps per day over a year, that's more than a quarter of a million steps that you've added that builds kind of your muscle strength and, and your cardio. Take a multivitamin or eat one more vegetable per day if nutrition is something that you struggle with. Um, set an alarm on your phone so you strand up every hour and stretch for 30 seconds. Um, set an alarm to get to bed 30 minutes earlier than usual if sleep is something you struggle with. Um, just pick, this can feel very overwhelming, pick one thing and do it for a month and then add one more habit on top of that. Small sustainable steps are really the key here. Um, in terms of your mental well-being, sign up for an app like Headspace or Aura, Unplug, Calm, whatever meditation flavor you prefer, um, and meditate twice a week and just do that for a month or two to get in the habit of it. Um, book in some time with a loved one every week to make sure you get some social support. Um, write down three things you're grateful for every night if you struggle with kind of negative thinking and, and not seeing the positive in your life. Um, or volunteer at a cause that's important to you and just pick that up. Or reach out and seek professional help. Um, these examples are just designed to give you a sense of some of the steps that you might see yourself being able to take and, and you're doing one thing differently every month. This is not a prescription for a healthy life, only you know what that looks like. Um, but change is, is, is not impactful unless it's sustainable. And picking just one thing to do to build your resilience, whether that's mental or physical, and just adding one on every month means that in a year's time, there are 12 habits you've built which are sustainable and do contribute to your well-being so that you can be um, thriving and not just surviving. So that's a lot of talking from me. Thank you for your attention. Um, I will hand over to Julian now to go through his content and then we will um, wrap up in a little while to take questions. So Julian, over to you. Thanks, Sylvie. Um, and look, uh, I suppose my sort of focus will be a bit of a flow on from what we've already um, discussed or what Sylvie's discussed around, um, you know, stresses and, and the the types of things such as habits that um, we can build into our own sort of um, daily practices uh, uh, to, Im to improve how we deal with stress and, and that sort of thing. And, and sort of just looking on the flow, th the flow through or the flow on of that in terms of our, our workforce as well you know this is really targeted at you know employers and uh, business leaders um, but you know how can we improve the sort of mental health uh, and the well-being of our, our workforce as well so um, you know we'll we'll have some some data sort of or some statistics up on the screen there which sort of suggests a, a few a few different things around mental health within um, the workplace but I, I think the biggest takeout for me is um, there's a bit of a disparity, I think, between what employers think they're doing or what investments employers think they're making into um, mental health in the workplace, and, and the and what employees are seeing. So, I, I mean, the top the top one there is 91% of employees believe mental health in the workplace is important. However, only 52% um, of employees believe that their their workplace is mentally healthy. Um, and and you know, it, it seems that employees are suggesting that they're not seeing the investment from their employers even when employers are making that investment. Um, 
I, I suppose the other the key thing for me is really looking at the cost. So again, this is some um, st- statistics from Beyond Blue, um, but businesses receive an average return on investment of two dollars thirty for every one dollar they invest in, in effective mental health strategies, um, making investment in mental health a win-win situation for employers and employees. Um, and we can see sort of down the bottom there that um, the cost of um, mental um, sort of mental health problems um, on on workers and employers is, is quite significant in terms of workers' compensation as well. So there has been a significant increase in, in workers' compensation claims, particularly, um, you know, this data is Australian-specific, um, but, you know, the average um, cost of a claim is 24500 compared to 9200 for for non-stress um, or mental health-related claims. So that, you know, that comes at a significant cost for for employers you know both in terms of of, of absenteeism um, and uh, cost of um, insurance coverage um, but also you know just the difficulties in terms of man- managing those sorts of situations because they are much more complex than, than most workers compensation type matters um, but yeah so that just, just gives a, a sort of feel for um, you know Mental health in in the, in the workplace uh, across Australia and, and New Zealand, and, and sort of the current situation and and how it's looking. Um, and then we'll turn to now sort of business implications, so the, the flow on effect of that sort of data, I suppose. And so we touched on workers' comp. Um, you know, overall, employers do have a responsibility to um, manage the the health and safety of their employees in, in the workplace. Traditionally, that's that's very much looked like physical workplace hazards, but more and more is looking much more like psychological uh, and mental health type hazards. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the, the costs of, of workers' compensation claims uh, are quite significant when it comes to, you know, psychological claims, you know, that from things such as bullying and harassment and, and workplace stress. Um, and, and that's only growing. Um, I think currently, or the latest data suggests that psychological claims are the fifth um, highest uh, type of claim um, within Australia in terms of workers' compensation claims. So, you know, the cost is only increasing and the complexity of dealing with those matters when they become a claim, um, you know, is is that much higher than, than normal types of claims on, in general. Um, of course, you know, absenteeism um, is quite significant when it comes to matters um, involving, you know, mental health and, and stress. Um, and, you know, that's no surprise that employees who are dealing with difficult situation have increased um, levels of, of absenteeism. Uh, I think employees who consider their workplace mentally unhealthy are almost four times more likely to have taken um, additional um, uh, personal leave or, or sick leave in the, in the past 12 months compared to um, what they would have taken otherwise. Um, and then we see, you know, presenteeism and engagement. Um, it's a, a reduction in in engagement um, from employees who are um, in mentally unhealthy workplaces or, or employees struggling with with mental mental illness. Um, you know, the feeling of being burnt out. Um, I think that's 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 increased quite significantly probably over the last couple of years, um, particularly with particularly with COVID-19 and, and dealing with the, the sort of stresses that have come with that, you know, in, in terms of, you know, increased hours of work, it seems that a, a lot of employees are working a lot longer because they're, they're working from home um, in terms of, you know, not being sure of whether, you know, the, their job's going to be safe and particularly early on, that was uh, quite a concern. Um, but then sort of the return to work as well um, seems to be causing, you know, additional levels of stress for some employees who, who may have concerns about their own health and um, and safety in terms of returning to the to the workplace, and then we see increased levels of turnover. There, there's no doubting that employers who make a significant uh, investment in, in in their employees, um, and, and particularly around their their health and safety and, and well being in the workplace, see a reduction in turnover. Um, so, so that, yeah, look, looking at all those sort of points together, it it, it really is. is painting that picture around costs and, and and wanting to reduce costs associated with, you know, things like recruitment and and, and selection and induction and training in absenteeism in lost productivity and dealing with conflict. Um, so, yeah, there are quite significant implications, I think it's safe to say, of, of employers when it comes to this sort of thing. 
So if we if we move forward now to, um, you know, how can we look to make workplaces mentally healthier? Um, the the Black Dog Institute um, in Australia have have made, you know, they they provide a lot of tools and resources for employers around um, looking to to make their their workplaces. Um, mentally healthier um, and providing those resources and training to to employers and managers of of, of employees. They're, they've got six main recommendations for, for how employers can do this. One, the first one is smart work design. So really looking at you know how we can design work so that it it you know it suits both the, the employer and the employee and, and looking at sort of flexibility in terms of working hours, flexibility in terms of working arrangements, um, involving staff in decision making, you know, consulting with staff, giving them the opportunity to to um, provide input. Um, monitoring staff workload as well is a, is another big one, uh, particularly at the moment with so many employees working from home. Um, and, and it seems to be a lot of employees are just sort of turning a blind eye in terms of how many hours their employees are working and, you know, um, or they may not have the resources to monitor this sort of thing. So it's putting in, put in place practices, practices um, to make sure that we're, we're looking at, at that. Um, Building personal resilience, and and certainly Sylvie has has, t- has spoken to this um, from an individual standpoint in some great detail. But look, providing stress management and resilience training to employees, um, you know, providing and encouraging regular physical activity. Um, so, you know, what do we have in place in terms of programs within our workplaces around you know things like September, um, you know, sort of um, gym memberships or um, you know, corporate programs around entering in, um, you know, fun runs um, and that sort of thing or, or sort of lunchtime yoga or, or, or running clubs um, and also just, you know, coaching and, and um, mentoring employees around, you know, resilience. Um, building better work cultures. So um, this is very much about having – it's about leadership and, and having conversations about mental health um, and providing education to, to employees in order to reduce stigma and having open conversations about mental health conditions and where employees can go for um, for support. Um, increasing the awareness, so similarly providing access to employees around you know, information for, to, for mental health-related issues. Uh, talking openly uh, about mental health in the workplace um, and, and sort of overall awareness programs. And as I mentioned, that there's so many available to employers in Australia and New Zealand now. Um, looking at supporting staff recovery for mental health, so um, providing supervisor or manager training um, around how they can uh, more proactively assist the employees who, who struggle with mental health-related issues, um, modifying duties uh, and work schedules as appropriate, um, and provide a supportive environment um, for employees as well. And, and I think it, it sort of sort of all ties into sort of early intervention. So, um, you know, encouraging staff to, to seek help early and, and assist them in terms of knowing where they can get that help. Um, and, and certainly you know, having access to things such as um, employment assistance program, employment assistance programs, EAP and, and that sort of thing for employees. Um, and now I, I've just included a, a brief excerpt from uh, a recent survey around workplace resilience, sort of tying back into what we've been discussing um, earlier on around um, resilience from an individual standpoint, and then um, assisting our employees with with their resilience further. Um, and this survey really had some some great findings. I felt um, it, it really it was conducted this year, so a lot of it is, I suppose, within the context of of COVID nineteen and employees feeling burnt out, um, having to be really flexible in terms of responding to you know, changing their work conditions or, or their work set up, potentially working from home and having to sort of marry up their work responsibilities with their their um, family life responsibilities, particularly if they've got other people working from home in their family or, or, or school, school children working from home with them. Um, and, you know, 38% of workers said mental health and wellbeing is ne- negatively impacted by COVID. Um, employers believe that work-life balance and is a top priority for, for workers now. So, I think this is very much in the context that employers feel that and employees feel that the pandemic has negatively impacted um, 
employees work life balance for a range of reasons some of them i, I mentioned earlier like increased working hours um you know working from home while this while the school children uh, are doing school at the same time um uh and you know other things as well like um employers really not having as much access to employees for development conversations and really sort of planning a path for career development and that sort of thing. So, so in some respects, workplace flexibility, particularly through work from home, has actually reduced employee wellbeing um, is some of the findings. So, um, you know, and, and it's things like, in, you know, instead of reading a book on a commute or potentially meditating on the train or listening to music, you're catching up with colleagues, you know, um, at lunchtime or, or getting a coffee. Employees are... Um, working longer hours and, and working through breaks and that sort of thing. So this, um, you know, the employers who responded to this survey, um, in terms of the ones who have seen benefits, have made some recommendations. You know, firstly, offering increased you know, paid time off. That seems to be a, a no-brainer. And it does seem, I know a lot of businesses, um, particularly in the last six months or so, have provided additional um time off to employees, you know, a couple of additional days uh, just to, um, you know, sort of regroup um, and, and just get that little bit extra time off knowing that they've really put in the hard yards over the last couple of years. Um, offering increased support for parents. Parents have really struggled over the last couple of years. So you can definitely see that parents are feeling much more burnt out. Um, focusing on productivity rather than working hours. So this sort of goes through the, the points around, you know, the, the increased number of of working hours um, that we've seen over the last couple of years. I think there was some, some data recently published um, that suggested that in employees in Australia working um, so many more hours um, each week that it amounted to about seven weeks per year of additional work that they were performing. Um, so you could definitely see that uh, if there was a, more of a focus on productivity than actual working hours, then that might go some way to re reducing that. Um, asking your employees how they'd like to improve their work-life balance um, and providing managers and leadership with training around promoting work-life balance uh, among, among colleagues as well. So, yeah, so that's um, some of the... The, uh, the content there that we really wanted to focus on in terms of the flow through around mental health and well-being in the workplace. So that really wraps up the today's session. Um, but of course, we have time and availability for questions. Um, so yeah, feel free to enter those in the chat or the Q&A now and, and we, can, uh, we can see to your question and hopefully uh, provide uh, a good response. Uh, Sylvia, are we seeing any questions come through? I, I actually had a question for you as a, as a trans Tasman colleague while we let our um, wonderful attendees kind of type away and put their questions in. Um, in, in your career, what's the intervention from a, a business perspective that you've seen make the most difference to health and wellbeing at work? What would stand out as like the thing that's made the biggest impact? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question because you, you, you do see these programs a lot and you really wonder how effective some of them are. I think the, the best ones I've seen um, are when it is the, a leader from the organisation really taking the lead and promoting the um, intervention. So whether it's, you know, providing additional time off or whether it's um, promoting access, you know, greater access to things like employment assistance programs or just encouraging greater conversations, you um, within the workplace, I think whatever it is, they probably all are quite effective, but they're really only as effective as the um, having the leadership support to promote the initiative from the get-go and, and sort of reinforcing it as much as they can and talking to the benefits of it, talking to the benefits that they've seen in themselves, how they use the program um, and so on. Um, those that That's probably... Um, the, the the best I, I've seen is, is when it really is is from the top, um, but yeah, certainly um, you know things promoting physical health I think are always really quite popular and, and really quite valuable as well. Um, I mean, how about yourself, Silly? What what have what have you seen that that's worked pretty well? Um, 
I would agree with your observations that you there has to be leadership support, right? If you have someone who's in a role like you and I are often in, in the HR or the wellbeing seat, trying to push something that the leadership kind of doesn't really isn't really committed to and doesn't get on board with, um, yep. that's been I've never seen that work very well. Um, I think I have always been surprised by the amount of change that can be generated just by someone in the organization even at a peer level kind of opening up about some stuff we tend to think of leadership as being a position but actually leadership is uh, is behaviors right so I know that in roles I've held previously and certainly during my time at my HR as well um, when I've had colleagues like personally open up either to me as a, as, a, as a mate or kind of in the team to say, I'm having a really shit time right now and it looks like this. Can you please be aware that I'm going to be a little bit fragile or I'm going to be a little bit distracted or I'm going to be whatever. Um, so just kind of work that into your expectations about what I can deliver for you or how we're going to interact together. Um, particularly as a, as a younger person, um, I always really found that quite inspiring that they would have the courage to be vulnerable in a workspace. And it meant that when I was having a rough time, I also could go, hey, like, hey team or, or my direct reports even, I'm having a bit of a tough day or a tough week. So I'm, I'm here and I'm doing my things, but I just need you to be a bit nicer to me <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. You know? yeah. so, so the permission and the, the role modeling that I've seen um, people who weren't in management or leadership kind of positions, but who led by example in terms of that vulnerability and, and talking about what was going on with them and then asking for what they needed. Um, yeah. That's that's certainly been a, a driver of change that I've, um, yeah, have always admired and found really compelling. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, I think we've had a few things come through. Uh, oh, someone logging out, but just wanted to say that they were thankful for today's session. Oh, um, thanks, Jackie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it sounds like we um, we've we've covered all our, our bases there. I think Sylvie. Um, yeah, yeah, heaps of good, heaps of we've good stuff in there. We've done uh, a good job. Or we've talked them asleep, depending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Depending on whether they're jumping in. Um, the yeah, and, I guess. <gasps> Sorry. Sorry, I was going to say just another anonymous attendee. It's a great session. Um, but yeah, sort of no, no major questions. Coming through. I mean, Julian, I always love some positive feedback from webinars. So if you want to tell us some nice things, it's always super welcome. Um, look, these topics can be a bit confronting to talk about sometimes in, in kind of an open forum. Um, and I know that we're all pretty busy in the lead up to Christmas. So um, from my perspective, hopefully you've taken away some some ideas or some suggestions or, or there's been a turn of phrase maybe that Julian's used or that I've used that's really stuck with you. So if there are um, any questions or any ideas you wanted to talk to either of us about privately later, um, you're very welcome to get in touch. My email is sylvie, S-Y-L-V-I-E at myhr.works. You can also get in touch using our email address, help at myhr.works, which is the same for New Zealand and Australia. Um, and I'll let Julian sign off and then we'll wrap the session today. Yeah, and likewise, you can contact me. My name, my email address is julian at myhr.works and, and the same at um, help at myhr.works as well. So thanks, everyone, for attending today's session. Um, we've really enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, um, if you want to get in touch, please do so. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you to everyone. See you later. Bye.